Welcome to this panel discussion on Syria's displaced health workers, uh, policy opportunities and challenges. Uh, my name is Rita Dayoub. I am a Syrian activist and a dentist. I'm also an academy associate with the Center on Global Health Security at Chatham House. This collaboration with uh, Research for Health in Conflict project at King's College London. Uh, the American University of Beirut and the University of Cambridge. If you would like more information about the Syria Public Health Network, please visit their website or find them on Twitter at Health Syria. Um, this event is public and is being live streamed uh, on YouTube. So feel free to tweet using the hashtag uh, Syrian Health Workers. Um, so today we will focus on Syria's displaced health workforce in countries outside of Syria, but who remained in the region. For example, in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Um, more events on Syria's healthcare workers inside Syria or who are displaced outside of the region will be planned in the uh, coming months, so stay tuned. Um, the health of Syrians and the healthcare system in Syria have been overwhelmed after nearly 10 years of conflict. Healthcare workers and healthcare facilities have been criminalized and systematically attacked, with approximately a thousand healthcare workers um, killed. Data from the World Health Organization and the Syrian Ministry of Health indicate that only 52% of public hospitals within the country are um, still operational. In this panel discussion, our speakers will present the latest data and information on the situation of displaced healthcare workers in neighboring countries as well as in Europe. Case studies and policy options for host community governments are outlined. Um, these demonstrate how displaced healthcare workers can be supported, uh, which not only helps displaced individuals and their families, but also, but can also uh, benefit the health and the social welfare systems of host countries. So without further ado, let me present our first speaker, um, who will be Ibadat Dillon. Uh, Ibadat is a technical officer at the World Health Organization at the Department for Health Workforce, and he will be giving us an overview of refugee and migrant health workers globally. The floor is yours, Ibadat. Thank you. and. Uh... Thank you for inviting me. I don't know if you can see my slides. I hope you can. Um, I will yes, have to really uh, provide a global overview of international health worker mobility, so the movement of health workers across boundaries. Um, I'm sorry, my slides, my computer is going in and out. I hope it's not the same for you. <laughs> um, we can see the first slide. Okay. Yep. Good. So. Uh, yes, yeah, so I will probably provide an overview of international health worker mobility. There's been a lot of discussions uh, on this subject, and as you will see, especially in the context of COVID, um, I will start. For a long time, countries have been complaining about or raising concern to the UN, the UN level around the challenge of health worker migration, the issue of brain drain and funda fundamentally to support the absorption of health workers in developing countries. So the first one is a UN General Assembly resolution from 1973, where people realize that it's not just about educating health workers, but there has to be capacity to employ health workers where they're most needed. The issue rose up again in 2000, where again, the global community recognized that the two most pressing issues in the topic of migration and mobility was the flood of skilled workers from poor countries to rich countries and the flood of, uh, as well as the issue of uh, low skilled workers. Uh, but really this idea of highly skilled workers being drawn to uh, wealthier countries and the challenges associated with that uh, were regularly understood. Of course, since then, a lot of things have happened. Um, we've also seen the crisis in the Middle East, uh, which has further exacerbated this issue. And most recently, a pandemic, which again, in many cases, we have seen what some have descri described as a race to the bottom or a global scramble for health workers. 
I think everyone realizes the importance of health workers and, and the real, the urgency to be able to use them in different contexts. So this is just a little background. Next slide. I won't go into detail on this, but at WHO, at the sectoral level, we have a framework that helps guide international movement of health workers. Uh, and uh, Ola Barra, I think, who is part of this group, has been an active contributor in our discussions. And we, have, we are looking both at the issue of migration, migrants and refugees, uh, permanent mobility, but also temporary mobility. But I won't go into more detail, except that this is an instrument that is helping us advance ethical principles and helping us get better information. And this may be relevant to your discussions as, as uh, time proceeds. Um, linked to the code, we've also had uh, the data on health worker mobility has never been greater. Uh, this is from a recent publication from OECD, one of our partners, where we're looking at the subject. And you can see, for example, that uh, when you look at the, the data on Syrian health workers working in OECD countries, uh, that there's about 9,000 as counted through the different council registers uh, currently practicing in OECD countries. Uh, if you look at time trends, there was virtually no data on this group until a few years ago, and suddenly we could see a significant amount in, as picked up in OECD reports. So this may be a useful resource to look at as you're trying to compile a global picture. But the movement is linked to the broader movement of health workers. So this is some, again, data we have from, um, oh, uh, I think this is, again, uh, you're seeing the slide where we're talking about uh, the movement of doctors and nurses. Uh, so for here, we have data from about 80 countries. And we can see across countries, there's increasing and high reliance on foreign health workers. And it's particularly high for doctors, dentists, pharmacists. So these are professions that are moving across boundaries uh, and moving considerably with many countries, such as Jordan, highly reliant on foreign trained health workers. So in Jordan, and in terms of data they provide us, about 70% of the people working in Jordan are foreign trained doctors. So, so it is not simply the OECD that is relying on uh, uh, foreign trained workers. It is across the, across the world we are seeing uh, significant reliance. Uh, and, uh, but the need, of course, is the most pronounced in low-income countries. I won't go into this detail up here, but again, we, we expect that the need will continue to accelerate in the years ahead. And this is uh, estimates from different places in the OECD. The EU expects an additional 1.8 million health sector jobs to be added by 2025. Germany needs 500,000 health workers uh, in a very short period. Similarly for Japan, Norway, and the United Kingdom. So this is, this is clear that there's a big, big demand in rich countries for trained health workers. Uh, clearly, this is of relevance to the discussion that you're having today. Uh, and this is before COVID. So this was, these were all projections prior to COVID. So we anticipate that these pressures will only accelerate and we will see increasing international mobility. This is a small graph. I won't go into the details on it, but it is showing that the movement is not just from the south to the north. There's significant movement around the world of, uh, of health workers. They're moving from the south to the north, from the north to the south. They're moving interregionally. Uh, this is the discussion here, very significantly. And, and we are seeing the much more the internationalized, internationalization of health professional education. I won't go the details here. But just as an example, you know that we really, as we're trying to gather this data, we have to really start understanding the patterns of movement, and this is not easy. So we have to start, look, this is again, this is data provided to us from Qatar. So when you look at the data provided to us by the OECD, we saw 9,000 doctors from Syria working in OECD. This was data provided to us in 2018, 2019. We are now doing rerunning this uh, reporting cycle this year. And you can see that uh, you know that, the, that Syria is the second leading source of doctors to uh, uh, Qatar, almost 1,000 doctors. And while when, but when we talk about nurses and pharmacists, not so prominent, but then again, when it comes to dentists, very prominent, prominent in Qatar. So as you are doing your work, I think even for, for WHO, it is very helpful to understand the where, because the patterns of movement are so complex. 
similarly, we've heard anecdotally from colleagues in South Africa that there's a lot of uh, health workers from Libya and Syria who've come into South Africa as well. So again, it is a complex pattern of movement. Um, the increasingly now we are seeing the internationalization of medical education. I think with a lot of Syrian refugees, they will get retrained in a different place. And it will get even more complex in measuring their movements because they will be Syrian born, perhaps the beginning of their education might maybe in a certain place, uh, but perhaps they continue it somewhere else and then they are seen as trained in that context. So we are seeing increasing internationalization of medical education. Um, and then with COVID, we are seeing uh, very, very easing of regulatory pathways to enable health workers to practice. Uh, this is across the board. Uh, we have a lot of data collected on this. This is again uh, uh, relevant for the Syrian health workforce. Uh, I haven't personally looked at the flexibilities provided to Syrian health workers, but we have seen, for example, that the health workers, the refugee workers from Venezuela, the, the pathway to employment in other Latin American countries was significantly eased. Uh, similarly, in general, the regulatory systems have been eased to enable uh, migrant health workers uh, to practice. And I think this slide is perhaps the most relevant slide for you because it, it is a slide that tries to put together really the complexity of players and partners who are engaged as a health worker moves from one uh, jurisdiction to another jurisdiction, uh, the, the complexity of uh, the processes, the complexity of the, the, the amount of time it takes and the amount of money it takes. And so this is something, again, I think we had the meetings earlier where we were providing examples around process places like Sweden, which have actively eased the, this regulatory process uh, to enable uh, migrant health workers to practice uh, faster. Um, so I think uh, from my side, it was really what I had hoped to do was provide a global context and overview, uh, pointing to the fact that mobility we will see continuing to accelerate. Uh, there's a need to balance, to have for greater balance and coherence on this subject. Um, many, many, many different ministries and stakeholders are engaged. From WHO's uh, perspective, it is really important that it's not just uh, ministries of trade, ministries of labor, uh, home affairs, uh, a ministry of education that is engaged, but that the health sector should be engaged in the discussion and that the affected uh, individuals themselves, the health workers themselves are engaged in these processes. Uh, and for us, our, our key normative instrument is the code, which really identifies that we have to look at this issue of mobility as one that can benefit the source country, the destination country, and ensure that the rights of the health workers who are on the move. So this is simply, I would recommend the, the code to you uh, to use. And uh, from our side, we really look forward to learning from your discussions uh, and capturing it as we capture uh, you know, the policy discussions in this area. So thank you. Thank you, Ibadat. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for highlighting this very important topic that is very relevant to the COVID to the COVID nineteen pandemic, especially as we see a lot of um, a lot of health systems uh, around the world struggling to cope. And it's great to know that we now have reliable data um, on this topic. Um, so um, I'll introduce the second speaker who will give us an overview about the situation um, in Syria. Uh, so we have Diana Reyes who is a member of the Syria Public Health Network and also a PhD candidate and John, at uh, John Hopkins University. So uh, Diana, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rita. And thank you so much, Ibadat, for that useful overview. Um, it's great to be here with you all today. Uh, let's make sure you can all see my screen okay? In full mode? Okay, yeah. excellent. So yes, I'm just going to uh, situate us further in the topic of, of Syrian healthcare workers and give an overview of the drivers of the Syrian healthcare workforce, uh, drivers of displacement of the Syrian healthcare workforce and also their situation in countries surrounding uh, Syria. So a little bit about Syria's health system pre-conflict. Um, the total population um, by World Bank estimates was about 21 million and health trends were really on the rise. Um, 
before the conflict uh, as estimated by the Ministry of Health. So between 1970 and 2009, Syria had seen an increase in life expectancy from about 56 to 73 years. Um, there had been decreases in infant mortality, under five mortality and maternal mortality. So these were significant changes that happened uh, right before the onset of the conflict in 2011. Um, in 2009, the Ministry of Health also estimates that the number of healthcare workers included about 30,000 doctors, 16,000 dentists, um, and then you can see the estimates here for nurses, midwives, and technicians. Um, the uh, issue with these numbers and the issue that remains today is that there are a lot of challenges in terms of uh, validating this data or uh, making sure that it remains updated. There's also uh, sites of poor transparency from the Ministry of Health in terms of data collection as well as um, uh, corruption. Um, inequity is also an issue that had resulted in, in doctors and healthcare workers being concentrated in certain districts in Syria and not necessarily covering all of the geographical areas, so uh, broadly leaving out uh, rural populations mainly. Um, there is also a lack of qualified nurses and allied health professionals, something that remains today, and an underutilization of talent and capacity. Um, so this led to a lot of high turnover before the conflict, um, as well as an uneven distribution of services and also emigration. And while we don't have uh, very accurate estimates of numbers of health workers, um, Syrian health workers in the diaspora, uh, there are significant numbers uh, that emigrated to the US and the UK uh, before the conflict and, and afterwards. So post-conflict, um, I could go on and on about this, but um, I think many of you know that the health system in Syria is extremely fragmented. Um, it's been decimated by uh, almost a decade of conflict. Um, and it's also extremely politicized, so um, very separated in terms of uh, control and also um, coordination um, throughout the country. Um, over 13.5 million people are in need of humanitarian assistance. And um, unfortunately, throughout the conflict, healthcare has been used as a weapon of war. And um, the Physicians for Human Rights have cited almost uh, 600 attacks on healthcare um, since the beginning of the conflict. Um, and this has resulted in about 50% of the hospitals um, across the country as fully functioning. 26% uh, are partially functioning and 24% are, are non-functioning. And this represents areas um, that are reported by the Ministry of Health. Um, in Northwest Syria, you have even higher numbers of non-functioning hospitals, about 41% non-functioning. 61% uh, fully functioning. Um, of course, this is representing a smaller number um, in this part of the country, which has been particularly impacted um, by the conflict. Uh, this is an assessment that was conducted by the World Bank in 2017, which looked at the damage to total health facilities um, in Syria. And so you can see here the, um, the disproportionate impact of, of um, the conflict on health facilities in places like Idlib, like Dara, Homs, Derzor, uh, Duma, 100% um, of hospitals and facilities are partially damaged. Um, there have been more damage incurred um, in the last few years since this assessment was conducted, and particularly in Idlib. Um, but this is an important reminder of what, uh, at set, what's at stake for the Syrian health system. Um, and zooming in a little bit on the health workforce and impact uh, post-conflict onset. Um, so since 2011, um, the, the start of the conflict, um, as early as March, there was a report of an attack on a healthcare facility. This was Dara National Hospital, which was actually the origin of the Syrian conflict. Um, in April 2011, uh, there were reports of pro-government forces arresting doctors, paramedics, and patients in protest areas, and particularly those who were helping protesters or, or healing them. Um, and this is ongoing today. Um, in March 2013, we saw the first attack, uh, chemical weapons attack in Syria, um, which was the first of many, um, including um, attacks that impacted health facilities um, on purpose. And um, in 2013, uh, there were estimates of over 15,000 doctors who had fled Syria. So from the previous number that I had showed you, which was uh, almost 30,000, uh, this is about 50% of doctors as of 2013. In uh, November 2016, a UN official cited that 27,000 doctors had fled Syria. So this is closer to 90% of the original number that I had shared with you. Um, in December 2016, of course, we saw the siege of Aleppo and over 95% of Aleppo's doctors had fled, been detained or killed. And um, as of March 2020, I was looking for the most updated uh, statistics to share with you all. Um, the UN continues to cite that over 70% of healthcare workers have left Syria, but we think this is an underestimate. 
I'm sure many of these headlines look familiar to you. Um, the issue of medical workers being targeted throughout the Syrian conflict um, is one that's captured um, uh, global attention. Um, and it's unfortunately an issue that continues to impact Syrian doctors today, not only those inside the country, but those who have been displaced. And um, I also wanted to mention that there are doctors who are, um, are on the other side of the, of the, um, the situation here where they've, uh, they've found that doctors who have been tortured uh, or have tortured individuals um, inside Syria are also being um, accused of, of crimes against humanity. And most recently, a Syrian doctor has been arrested in Germany um, for abusing um, his powers um, as, a, as a physician. So the issue of healthcare um, workers in Syria is, is one that's, that's particularly popular and is discussed a lot in the literature as well. Uh, Physicians for Human Rights uh, has a database that covers the amount of medical personnel that have been killed. And the total number of um, medical personnel that they've reported is about 923 since 2011. And um, the implications for Syrian healthcare workers who've remained in, inside Syria um, since the start of the conflict is just that, is the risk of being killed by attacks on healthcare, the risk of detention or torture. Um, severe shortages of healthcare workers um, have resulted in extra burden being placed on healthcare workers um, inside Syria who've remained. And uh, the lack of qualified health professionals and new graduates to help replenish uh, the, the numbers that have been displaced. Um, poor access to medical supplies and resources is an issue particularly in the Northwest part of the country. Um, and this includes continuing medical education and access to updated um, information on how to expand their medical practice. Um, there are really lack of incentives to stay. Most of the Syrian healthcare workers that I've spoken to are purely motivated to stay inside Syria to help their neighbors and to help their, um, their brothers and sisters. Um, but other than that, um, a lot of people have uh, decided to leave in order to seek safety for their families and for themselves. And not to mention the trauma that um, a lot of healthcare workers have endured in the last decade um, being attacked and, and targeted as healthcare professionals. And now with COVID-19, these issues have only been exacerbated. So I thought I would share some of the existing data on uh, the Syrian healthcare workforce. It's a little bit elusive and hard to find, but hopefully these resources can help you in your future research. And these are updated uh, usually on a six month basis. So one of the first resources is WHO HERAMS, the Health Resource uh, Availability Monitor, I believe that's the abbreviation for that. Um, and you can see here that uh, the, as of June, 2020, the total number of medical doctors is about 12,000. Um, and that's um, a number that when you compare it to the pre-conflict estimate is it's much, much lower. Um, in public health centers, so the previous graph was public health hospitals, but in public health centers, you have an even lower distribution of medical doctors, about 4,000. The Ministry of Health also has a database on healthcare workers that they publish. Um, and you can see this here, it includes um, from 2000 to 2019, and also this number uh, from 1970, which might have been a census that was conducted on the number of healthcare workers um, back, back then. And um, it's a very interesting graph because you can see that after the onset of the conflict, the number of healthcare workers uh, or physicians namely here increased. Um, but this is um, uh, something that uh, casts doubt on the, the accuracy of this data because uh, we also see that other resources like HERAMS have listed um, that healthcare workers have been displaced massively after the onset of the conflict. Um, there's also a, a repository on the number of dentists uh, you can also find pharmacists, midwives, um, and, and healthcare technicians also on the Ministry of Health website. But important to keep in mind that these numbers might not be entirely accurate or updated. Um, also wanted to share with you the HERAMS reporting on a number of health staff um, in public hospitals and how it compares to the IASC or the Interagency Standing Committee standards. Um, you can see in Syria that um, most districts um, have an, um, uh, um, they, their healthcare worker population is below the standards um, enforced by AAAC, so under 22 uh, per 10,000 population. And in Northwest Syria, this disparity is even greater. Um, you can see across districts in Northwest Syria, the number of healthcare workers are much lower than that orange line there, which is the, the standard that um, is expected globally of a healthcare workforce per population. 
So the question really is where are serious healthcare workers now? And most people don't really know. Um, we know that there are many healthcare workers among the uh, millions of, of refugees that have been displaced to uh, countries surrounding Syria and also to Europe. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have any centralized or public data on distribution. And there's a lot of political disincentives to map out or understand the distribution of healthcare workers, especially in countries surrounding Syria, um, because this would uh, cause competition for the local healthcare workforce, um, especially in countries where um, healthcare workers already have a difficult time accessing jobs. And so the refugee healthcare workforce um, is, is definitely um, a source of competition in some places like Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey. I wanted to share some of the work that the Syria Public Health Network has conducted. Uh, we've done a lot of work mapping the uh, presence of the Syrian healthcare workforce in countries like Lebanon. We looked at the informal healthcare provision of Syrian healthcare workers in Lebanon and um, how they, they support uh, their fellow Syrian refugees living in, in this host country and also how they manage and access um, uh, the health system despite the circumstances and the policies restricting their employment. Um, so this is a conflict in health paper that we published with colleagues at AUB. And um, you see Syrian healthcare workers that we've interviewed there really were uh, keen on reducing the burden on the Lebanese health system, but were, um, were enforced by legal issues um, to, to not be able to integrate it formally into the healthcare system. And um, in terms of other countries like Jordan and Turkey, um, the formal licensing and accreditation requirements for Syrian healthcare workers is quite difficult. And for the most part, they're not really permitted to access the, the labor market. Um, so you have to have very formalized educational uh, qualifications and recognition and also testing in order to practice formally. And this is virtually impossible for Syrian healthcare workers in Jordan and Lebanon. Now in Turkey, um, there are more opportunities and my colleague Hassan will speak about this in more detail but there is a recognition of educational qualifications coming from Syria and also a capacity for healthcare workers to work in migrant health centers and to support the refugee population there. So um, another uh, aspect that we've looked at is uh, healthcare workers, Syrian healthcare workers living in Europe. So uh, looking at integration of, of this population in Germany specifically. And um, when we did qualitative interviews with Syrian refugee healthcare workers in Germany, we found a lot of uh, various barriers that were faced by these healthcare workers, including uh, personal barriers and the burnout of having been displaced and now coming to a new country and starting from scratch. Uh, very uh, difficult um, uh, opportunities to actually integrate into the, the healthcare workforce formally. You have to learn a new language, you have to learn a new culture, and then take um, equivalent training exams and, and also be recognized and accepted by colleagues and patients. So um, these are very interesting studies that I think um, can tell us a lot about other contexts where Syrian refugee healthcare workers are displaced and are looking to be integrated. So Germany can be used as a case study um, where you have a large number of, of Syrian refugee populations integrating into the healthcare workforce. And um, my colleague Hassam and, and others on the panel will go into more detail on that experience. And overall, just wanted to end with what the benefits of integration and inclusion of these populations are for host countries, uh, usually brings a lot of economic benefit to, to countries like Germany, uh, Sweden, and others that have integrated Syrian healthcare workers into their, into their workforce. Um, and this includes um, during the COVID-19 response, especially. Um, and then also helping support local health systems and universal health coverage. So um, allowing uh, displaced healthcare workers to integrate into the formal market. Um, it also provides employment opportunities for these uh, healthcare workers and encourages their integration, um, not just through work, but also socially. And uh, lastly, in summary, I wanted to um, uh, provide some, some takeaways here um, in regards to the Syrian healthcare workforce. So um, we do have little accurate data on the numbers and you can see the variety of sources that we have um, currently. And um, the, the key takeaway here is that the displaced healthcare workforce really can make a critical contribution to local health systems. And um, it's really important that host countries uh, take into account um, how the Syrian healthcare workers ca workforce can be an advantage for their labor market. And um, we're going to end with Turkey offering a potential model for healthcare worker integration. And I'll have my colleague uh, talk in more detail about his experience there. Thank you very much for your time and please check out our new website.
Thank you so much, Diana. Thank you so much for um, this uh, very interesting and very important overview. Um, and I just want to add that this is not this work and this project is not only important for um, health itself, but it's also it's going to be very important for accountability and justice in the future and for peace building in the future. So, so thank you very much. Um, so uh, we actually before moving to uh, Hussam, who will be uh, um, um, giving us uh, an overview um, about experiences in Turkey, uh, we give you a short film. And to introduce the film, uh, I would like to introduce Vince Ian, who is the chair of the Lincoln Refugee uh, Doctors Project, and um, he will introduce the film for you. So, um, Vince, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me to be part of a very interesting discussion this evening. Um, yeah, I, I'm the chair of the Refugee Doctor Project in Lincolnshire. Um, there's a number of projects around the UK, five or six in total. We're the only ones operating in a very rural part of Lincolnshire. And as we've already heard, one of the reasons that host countries like the UK are uh, wanting to support refugee doctors from various countries, including Syria, is the shortage of workforce. Uh, simple as that. And obviously it takes a long time to train a doctor and cost a lot of money. Um, and so we set up a project um, four years ago. We've been running with refugee doctors for the last 18 months. We have 17 doctors recruited to our scheme at the moment, operating in two parts of Lincolnshire, one in northeast Lincolnshire in Grimsby, and another we've just recently started in Lincolnshire itself. Um, the project really takes the doctors through the various exams, the three key exams they have to go through to get their registration in the UK. It's called General Medical Council Registration, GMC. And, but we also, in our project, which is unique, support them on a social model as well. So we, we haven't got indigenous populations in Lincolnshire. Um, it's a very rural area and very low indigenous populations of refugees and also uh, other people from uh, around the world. So it's primarily 78% of the population is from Lincolnshire. Uh, I'm not, uh, but I live in that area. Um, and so recruiting doctors is very difficult. We don't train doctors in the county and it has a significant shortage. So we've got this double hurdle of not only training them, but also recruiting them to move to Lincolnshire. So we support them. We, we, uh, we work with the local authorities to provide housing for them. We also support them in terms of their social needs and also support their families and help them with uh, obtaining schooling and things like that for their families as well. Um, in the film that you're going to see, so that's a brief version of what we do. Um, in the film you're going to see, you're going to see three people. Um, a dentist who is training in Turkey, um, um, a doctor who is training in Germany, and also a, a doctor training in Lincolnshire, who is one of our uh, doctors. And the film itself gives a good variation of some of the information that you've already heard this evening. Um, both in terms of what's happening in Turkey, what's happening in Germany, and what's happening in the UK as well. But it's a, it's a nice illustration of what is taking place. And uh, uh, once you've seen the film, which you will do in a couple of minutes now, um, I, I'm very happy at the end of this to, to talk further about the project, but also what else might be required. Um, interestingly enough, um, and it was touched on by the previous speakers, um, the, although the, the registration of doctors has not been loosened in the UK, a new role of medical support workers has been developed and also is now being recruited to. And that's primarily because of the COVID-19 project that we've got a massive shortage of healthcare support workers uh, in the country at this moment, as long with doctors, nurses, dentists and so on. So this new role of medical support workers has been introduced and eight of our doctors, I'm glad to say, were recruited to the hospital in Grimsby me, including the doctor you're going to see uh, in a minute, and uh, they start work next Monday. So th that's going to not only help the healthcare system and the and the population of Lincolnshire, but it'll also help the doctors, we believe, because it'll help them with their integration and their understanding of how the UK healthcare system uh, operates. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce the film. Thank you very much.
I don't imagine my life without uh, being a doctor because yeah, I can say I want to be a doctor. These professionals left everything behind. Every day I remember Syria. I took Syria because I was not ready for it. I suffered a lot, but it was a choice I made at the right time. Hassan fled to Germany. He was a trained surgeon. Now he must qualify again. We must wait for the courses, the language courses on the papers. We must wait for the papers on the government uh, office uh, for your papers uh, as a doctor. And after the uh, passing the exam, you must uh, look for a uh, work and you must wait for the appointment with the hospitals and that takes time. Sidra's family fled to Turkey. She was in grade eight. Even then, her dream was to be a dentist. She learned Turkish, finished top of her class, and won a Turkish university scholarship. Bahra found refuge in the United Kingdom. He had studied medicine in English in Egypt. After I got my status, I started to look for, uh, for any opportunity or any organizations that could help refugee doctors. But I found help. The Lincolnshire Refugee Doctor Project in Grimsby, England. Their program helped them with housing and income and with support for courses, exams, and a placement. He now has a timetable in his mind. At first, I have to pass my English tests. I think it uh, maximum could take uh, me about three months. Then I have to prepare myself for the medical one, which is consists of two parts. I think it would take about four months. Then I have to make some attachments in the hospital. After that, I can apply for practicing uh, in any hospital I want. The Lincolnshire program helps 10 doctors a year. The goal is to persuade them to stay the region desperately needs doctors. And then we're going to focus on speaking today and specifically the clinical communication criteria. Okay, so finding, uh, finding out why the patient is here. Actually, you had a, a good question for that. Well, I will ask my patient what brings you here today. Uh, how, can, how can I help you today? Yeah. Dr. Aula Abara is an advocate for these professionals. And so there's great value in Syrian and refugee doctors. So these are doctors who are highly trained, highly skilled, uh, and usually among the top academic achievers in their cohort. So I wouldn't say that it's easy. There are a number of hurdles. And of course, it's the language, but beyond the language, it's the recognition of training that they've done and of their undergraduate and postgraduate qualifications. And it's also the time it takes, uh, not only to learn the language, but also to be able to book onto the various examinations that they need to do uh, for them to get their registration in place. Refugee health professionals must devote long hours to retrain. For Hassan, support from the German government has been crucial. Hello, بالنسبة لي لولا هذا الدعم ما كنت راح وصل لمرحلة الامتحانات الطبية والفحص كورسات اللغة مكلفة كورسات التخصصية الطبية التخصصية مكلفة جدا يعني لولا صراحة أنا ما كنت راح أقدر تابع طريقة بتعديل شهادة الطب بألمانيا. لو كانت الأمور الورقية والمراسلات أسرع. طبعا كان سهلت امور الطبيب بشكل كثير كبير وبنسبه 70% كان سهلت. دون المنحه كنت رح اضطر اختار فرع ثاني مثلا غير طب الاسنان، اني اشتغل وادرس لحتى طالع مصروف في الجامعه، اما بالمنحه هلا اخترت حسنت فوت الفرع اللي انا بدي اياه والحمد لله وقتي صار كله مكرس لدراستي. Actually, it's a good feeling that when you feel there's someone or some people that are supporting you to get your goals. That's very helpful. and they give you some sort of confidence. Training a new doctor or dentist costs well over $100,000. Retraining costs far less. So 
one reason for us to support them is that they can work in our health system and they may be able to work in areas where there is a great need of doctors or in specialties uh, which they can contribute to significantly where we have a shortage in the UK. And it's the same in Germany. So there's a shortfall of thousands of doctors, nurses and others at present. Um, and it's predicted that this shortfall is going to become even greater as the population ages. It really is in our interest that we support these Syrian refugee doctors and other refugee doctors to enter the workforce. Hassan's family is now in Germany. His wife is a dentist. She too is studying to restart her career. He dreams of a return to his specialty. إن شاء الله في المستقبل القريب إن شاء الله مثل ما كنت طبيب أخصائي جراحة عامة في سوريا سأكون هنا في ألمانيا. دكتور must not easily end his career and his work for an obstacle. Sidra is in her final year of university. If her application for Turkish citizenship is granted, she will be able to practice. فأنا طموحي يعني مو بس إني أتخرج الخمس سنين وخلص صرت دكتورة وأفتح حياتي وأقعد أعاين مرضى بس لا أنا عندي طموح ثاني إنه ممكن كمل اختصاص و... أو ممكن أدرس ماجستير ودكتوراه و... وهالقصص. البارا embraces the future. I think I will be here in some hospital here in Grimsby uh, practicing as a doctor. If I get my specialty, what I love, I want, uh, which is in surgery, I should work in a hospital. So I hope I can uh, manage my own operation room by myself after, let's say, five years. Their story is a success story. <laughs> but they are few. With more support, like the Lincolnshire program, many others could return to their vocations quickly and effectively. Their integration must be a political priority. Very inspiring. Um, thank you so much, Vince, for uh, introducing this film, and thanks for everyone who worked um, and for the who worked on this film and for the interviewees. Um, very inspiring indeed. Um, so this leads us very smoothly to our um, uh, fourth speaker, um, uh, who is Hossam Al Nahas. He is a member of the Syria Public Health Network and. Uh, Positions for Human Rights, and he will be sharing with us uh, some of his personal experiences uh, from Turkey and update on the general situation there. The floor is yours, Hossam. Thank you very much, Shrita, and thank you very much for for the video you you showed uh, earlier. It's it's always inspires me whenever I I watch it. Uh, so I will be speaking briefly about my experience in Turkey and the main challenges that I faced as a medical student and as, as a physician uh, later. So just to give you a, a background about uh, uh, about my experience, I started medical my medical education in 2006 in Aleppo University. Uh, and as smooth as it should be, I was anticipating to graduate in 2012, but uh, the Syrian uh, crisis uh, emerged in 2011 and I had to leave school so I can uh, provide uh, 
healthcare to those who were in need, uh, especially during demonstrations and when there was this unrest uh, due to the uh, civilian uh, movement. Uh, on 2012, I was uh, arrested by the government because of my work as, uh, as a physician. And when I was released, I made my decision to not continue my education and to go and work in the eastern part of Aleppo city where I can uh, provide health care and really fill the gap uh, in terms of health care providers in, in this area, uh, especially when it was systematically targeted uh, and hospitals were, were destroyed. Uh, in 2014, which is this the time between 2012 to 2014, the time that I spent in Aleppo, and then in 2014, I decided to move uh, to Turkey, to Gaziantep, where I started uh, learning the Turkish language, uh, so I can fulfill my dream in being a, uh, a physician. Uh, fortunately, in 2013, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Council of Higher Education in Turkey uh, like announce an, an, an executive order to allow uh, students who stop their education in war-torn countries to continue their education in, in Turkey. And they included all students who started their uh, academic education before 2013, before the year of 2013, 2014. So because I was, I started my medical education in 2006, then I was eligible to, uh, to apply through this road. So, I like to, sh sh to show this map, which uh, indicates the places that I apply to, to, can, to, to, to medical schools. Uh, and of course, you can imagine the amount of like financial burden and the mental burden related to having to apply to all those uh, universities with different requirements because the, uh, the Board of Higher Education provided the, the framework for, uh, for application, but they didn't give any details regarding the, the specific documents that are required or uh, the, the legal status to students uh, so they can be uh, so they can apply and of course because of the uh, the curriculum that we had in, in Aleppo University each university dealt with it differently so I was only accepted out of 28 universities that I applied to I was only accepted by two one of them accepted me as a first year student the other which was Istanbul University accepted me as a uh, fourth year student and of course the transition to the university was really smooth uh, I only had to bring all my document from Syria which I see as a challenge for those who were not privileged enough like me to have family members in Syria, not being on like any security list or not being blacklisted. So uh, my transcript was not blocked. I was able to renew my passport. I was able to issue a residency permission permission to apply for the university. But that was unfortunately not the case for many people who were unable to bring their uh, official documents from uh, from Syria. Uh, of course, uh, along with the with the registration, Syrian were waived from the tuition fees. Uh, so uh, as Syrian, I didn't have this challenge uh, as, as a challenge when I uh, was enrolled in the uh, in the universe, university. And of course, I was uh, part of the, the, commu the student community. I was welcomed by most of my professors and my colleagues until we start to realize that we are falling as victims to the political polarization in the country. Uh, so our affiliation as Syrians who benefit from some of the, 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 the decisions and executive orders that the government had in Turkey stigmatized us, if this is the correct word to say, as pro-government uh, uh, people in Turkey. So those who were uh, against the government as part of the opposition uh, or uh, opposition parties were practicing discrimination. And here I'm speaking about colleagues and professors. Uh, and of course, people we were interacting with uh, in hospitals during our uh, our rotations. Of course, the the government and the universities themselves have clear policies to fight against uh, discrimination and racism, but that was not implemented on 
on the ground. So there was no clear mechanism for students like us who face any discriminatory practice to to escalate it to the to the leadership uh, in the uh, in the universities. So I think that was really a huge burden uh, on us as students when we when we were trying to learn adapt with a new uh, with a new environment within the university and then struggling to introduce ourselves as Syrians, fearing that we might face some sort of discrimination or uh, racist uh, interaction with uh, with people. So we, we can, I, I continued my, my education and graduated uh, from uh, from the university. And again, I think the, the amount of knowledge and uh, the, in the university was just uh, great and helped me really fulfill my dream in being uh, a, uh, a physician. I graduated in 2018, and this is when I realized that there is a huge obstacle in front of me. So at that time, I applied for the Turkish citizenship. And of course, as a spouse to a Turkish citizen, I was anticipating that the process will be smooth. Uh, because as you can see here, those who are international graduates or those who graduated from Turkey, the, 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 the Turkish uh, regulations explicitly mention that those who don't have, hold the Turkish citizen Ship has different rules from those who have Turkish citizen, even if they are dual citizen. Uh, so for me as a Syrian citizen, I only had a, an option to enroll in a residency program where I will be considered as an international student, which means that uh, my work, although it will be, I, although I will have hold the same roles and responsibilities as the Turkish citizen, but the incentives will not be allow me to, to purely focus on my residency. So I will have to uh, have an extra job or financial support from other uh, source. While this is not the situation for the Turkish citizens or those who hold dual citizenship. Uh, and if, I'm, if I decide to go, to not go to the residency and start practicing as general practitioner, uh, again, if I'm not Turkish citizen, I only have limited options, which is uh, either to work in uh, migration health centers or uh, work in the private sector. So there is no way for me to access the public uh, sector uh, unless I get the, the Turkish citizenship. The problem with the migration health uh, centers is that although they are managed and governed by the uh, by the Turkish government, but they are funded by the European Union, and the there is different policies from the the uh, and procedures from the, the Ministry of Health in uh, governing and managing these centers, As, and that was clear during the COVID nineteen pandemic when. The, uh, the Ministry of Health recognized physicians uh, who were working in public in the public sector, and like they gave uh, like extra raises, for example, for their extra work that they were doing. While on the same time, those who were working on migration health centers were not treated the same, which again uh, forced those who were who were not working in the public sector to feel that they were treated unfairly uh, by uh, by the Turkish. Uh, uh, government. Uh, unfortunately, at at the end of my like the end of my story is that I was denied the Turkish citizenship, which means that I don't have uh, the I, I will not anymore have the ability to uh, to work in the public sector in in Turkey or seek uh, residency in Turkey uh, without thinking about other other challenges. Uh, so this is when I I uh, received the. Uh, the scholarship from Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And I think that was the main pulling reason for me to leave Turkey and uh, do my uh, master's degree in, uh, uh, in in the United States. Uh, again, um, I'm just, uh, I, I have to say that for me, Turkey and for a lot of co colleagues that I know, Turkey gave us a new opportunity to continue our education. And I think, as you mentioned, uh, Diana, Turkey make a, a 
great uh, example for uh, a, a, like a governmental approach to integrate uh, displaced health care uh, providers. But still, I believe there are many things to be uh, done to improve this response, mainly now as the the, again, the political polarization is escalating. There must be some uh, policies, procedures, and clear pathways uh, for uh, to advocate to, toward like uh, fighting against uh, discrimination and racism uh, within the the health system uh, in in Turkey. Uh, I will not take much longer, uh, and of course, I'm, I'm open to to answer any question. Thank you so much, Hossam. Thank you so much for um, sharing your experiences and for um, highlighting these impro this important issues. Um, and um, I do relate to what you said about the difficulty of getting like official documents from the universities. Um, I personally struggled with that a lot. So thank you so much for sharing this. Um, so our final speaker um, uh, is um, Fuad Fuad, who is a member of the Syria Public Health Network, uh, but he's also an associate professor at the American University of Beirut. And uh, I want to allow myself to say that he's also a poet. Uh, I know that uh, Fuad, you didn't write this in your bio, but um, I hope you don't mind that I'm sharing this. Um, and uh, Fuad will be sharing uh, with us um, uh, a bit about the policy recommendations and future uh, prospects uh, um, on how to deal with these issues about um, displaced uh, health workers, displaced Syrian health workers. Um, is Fuad still with us? Yes, you're here, I just saw you. Um, I just want to add that uh, after uh, Fuad uh, finishes his presentation, we will have a Q&A. So please, if you have questions, just write them down in the Q&A uh, chat box and we will we will uh, try to answer all of them. Uh, the floor is yours, Fuad. Thank you, Rita. You hear me well? Okay, great. So uh, thanks a lot for this introduction and for, for mentioning about poetry. I would like to recite poet, poetry more than talking about this tough issue. Uh, anyway, maybe maybe in the next panel about poetry that, uh, that could be more relief for me. Uh, and I would like also to thank the organizers, you know, for, uh, you know, giving me this great opportunity to be part of this interesting panel with the great colleagues. Um, uh, it's really difficult when, you know, someone, you know, uh, you know, ask about policy recommendation in such a sort of very difficult issue. And I was just in, a, in another um, round table and I, 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 I said something about this, how, how much I hate to write this paragraph in any paper about policy recommendation, because to be honest, I, I'm not sure I do believe a lot of having like policy recommendation, recommend whom and what about. So it's, a, it's again, another uh, tough uh, uh, task to, to, to do that. Saying, you know that so I would I would reflect more about to say to uh, to um, to bring more question to this tough topic more than recommending answers you know or solutions. One of the issue is listening to colleagues in the movie in the film and you know also the panelists you know all Syrian doctors that doctors and not just health workers they are doctors left Syria and no one mention about return. And this is the first issue that, you know, uh, thinking about when talking about refugee health workers, which is return. So very few data, you know, on that in, in, in literature. And even with this few data, uh, very few mention about return uh, refugee health workers after um, um, war or uh, protracted crises or sort of um, a sort of uh, you, uh, you know massive influx. So very few return to practice in in their uh, uh, original country. And while the uh, the crisis prolonged, the the uh, the the percentage you know of people that or physicians in specific that return 
the original country actually diminished and 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 and, and declined. So uh, so the word return uh, in, in 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 this context is quite difficult, and we need to think. So what does it mean when we lose a, a big number of uh, of health workers during a crisis like the one in Syria and the, the one like in Iraq, for example, you know, or maybe in Afghanistan after 30, 40 years of, of, of war and instability. So physicians move and they don't return. This is one. And what does it mean uh, from the original uh, country? It means that they lose their, their, their uh, uh, health workforce. Um, and that put a huge burden on the system. In, in, in Syria case, we know that the number is not quite uh, uh, well known, it's another problem about having good data as Diana mentioned. But in Syria case, there's a sort of number talking about, I don't know, maybe half of, of physicians left the country, but some said about 70%. Um, but by time we lose actually, um, those who have skills, you know, and, you know, good skills and well-educated from, I don't know, somewhere in, in Europe, they move to, to these countries, like what happened in Syria, moved to France, England, some back to, to, to the US and Canada. So, and, and so we have a new graduate uh, that, you know, um, uh, sort of um, being adapted with the situation, but by time, they also, those people move outside the country when, when the crisis also uh, 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 lasts long. So people do, do not return. A new generation, because of all these eco economic difficulties, instabilities, you know, they move out, they keep moving out. And that's still the situation now in Syria. You know, doctors keep moving out, even with, with a sort of, uh, I don't know, you know, less, uh, less armed conflict now, but still people moving out. That means the number inside Syria will go down quickly. That was why, why Diana mentioned that it's quite strange. After a long time, still we have, you know, the numbers about 30,000, which is, again, the, it's not secret. People inside Syria knows that we have what they called it, you know, doctor registered at the at the um, physician's order, but they do not move remove his name when he uh, when he when he left and pay you know the, the fees. So the names are there, the numbers are there, but the doctors in in person are not. This is one. Second issue is about you know moving uh, uh, to the neighboring countries, like what happened in in Syria to. Iraq to, to uh, Lebanon, Jordan, and Turkey with all these difficulties that I will come back to this. But actually, a, a, a sort of considerable number moved before and after the, uh, the, uh, the Syria crisis to Gulf state. The Badat mentioned, you know, to a number, actually striking number even to me, I, I didn't uh, uh, thought that the number in, in Qatar is 1,119 doctors in Qatar, it's a small country. So just think about, I know people actually, they choose to go to Emirates and Saudi Arabia because you know the market is bigger and they move there. So I wasn't, I wasn't aware to be honest about Qatar. So if Qatar is that number of 1000, so you can think about those uh, in, in Gulf state. So a huge number. And I, 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 I'm sure that many of us, you know, have, you know, uh, uh, relatives, friends are, are working there, and they can easily can you know imagine the number. In Gulf state, it's a specific condition. It's not like in in Jordan, uh, Lebanon, or even Turkey. You know they can work. You know it's easy. They can get a work there and and engage in the uh, uh, work market. But what happened after 10, 15, 20 years? Usually. When the, when the doctor finish you know, his contract and retire, finish the contract, he or she should move outside the Gulf state. There, there is no you know, residence permit after finishing your work permit. So moving out. In the past, before the Syria crisis, usually they come back you know, 
collecting money, come back, you know, retired, come back to Syria. And what happened now that those people, you know, uh, have sort of two, uh, two tracks to, to follow. Either, you know, to go to Europe, you know, um, retire there, which is, you know, if they are, you know, having some money and have an, another citizen, citizenship, so that could, or actually, which is another case, they go and, and, and try to work again, which is at, the, at some age. So for example, I know people in my age, okay, 50, 60, they even try to do that, to integrate in the, in the uh, European system. Very few return to Syria, uh, especially if there's no any political uh, sort of uh, commitment or, or, or sort of, uh, um, loyalty. So they go back to retire in Syria. So the, the, the situation in, in, in Gulf State usually ignored in, in, the, in the discussion about you know, uh, uh, Syrian health workers outside. And I use health workers in between two brackets because what also Ibadat mentioned, you know, we, we have doctors leave to work and very few uh, other health workers like nurses, you know, midwives because of, uh, um, you know, the quality of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, of the, 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 the education that they have and also the, the language barriers that, you know, uh, you know prevent them to integrate either in Europe or in Gulf state. So, uh, and they, in Gulf state, they, they cannot compete also with the, with the other nationality. So when, when talking about Syrian health workers, what happened that we, you know, those who are physicians, they could find a sort of, of a pathway to continue their career or education, but we lose actually all other health workers, very, very few, you know, keep working, uh, you know, pharmacists or, or, you know, nurses, you know, working in, 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 in their career in uh, the future. So uh, back to this uh, tough word about uh, what to recommend. I don't recommend anything. What we, what we need to do actually first is we need to improve our data. I think this is something very important. After 10 years, we don't know exactly how many are inside the country, what sort of specialty capacity they have. You know, we still have very few, even the numbers. Uh, Diana again mentioned to, you know, numbers by Hirams that they focus on specific part or Ministry of Health that's messy numbers. So we don't have numbers even inside Syria. Definitely we don't have numbers outside Syria. You know, it, with a lot of work, it, in Lebanon, I, I work in Lebanon, I tried, we, we, we published this paper, how we couldn't know exactly how many doctors in, in Lebanon, let alone in Jordan. I, I think in, uh, in, in Turkey could be better, it could, uh, the situation, but, but, uh, uh, but again, there's a challenge there. Even in Europe, we know something about those in Germany and Sweden because they are to, to, to enter the, the, uh, the job market, whereas we have very few information about the other countries in Europe. I know in person many left to Netherlands, but none of them actually now are practicing, you know, and so, uh, so how many people in Netherlands? How many people, uh, you know, in, 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 in Italy? I mean, we have no idea about those, uh, you know, that are, could, could be assets like mentioned in the, in the movie, in the film, but, um, but we have no data about them. Neither numbers nor about the capacity. And by time actually, and to be honest, they, you know, those who are non-physician health workers, they losing their skills and moving to, to get their, you know, um, bread and food from, from different carriers. Second uh, uh, issue is about the issue. This is so. First is the data. Second issue is about the. I will. I will stop in a minute. Second issue is about the uh, integrating in in uh, in the national health system. You know, as mentioned by 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 colleagues. So I think this is important. You know, they are assets, so they are they, they can contribute. There's a need. The needs that showed by Ibadat 
is a huge, you know. So, so there's a need to, to, to integrate, to contribute in the system, but that means, you know, we need to be sure that this is, you know, sort of should be linked with other rights. So right to work, but also the, the right to have sort of an uh, equal in, in being uh, in, in salaries, you know, uh, or in being, you know, sort of protected by, by, the, by the system itself. Uh, uh, and that's the issue of retention. So retention is maybe not just inside Syria, which is, you know, I mean, this is uh, something we need to discuss hopefully in another panel, but, but even retention and then a new, a new destination, uh, and retention here should be linked directly with the issue of legality, of rights, of, of issue of job, uh, job permit. So I will stop here uh, and thank you very much. Maybe I can, I can answer a few questions if any. Thank you thank so you. much, Fouad. Thank you so much, Fouad. And thanks for uh, everyone, for all our speakers. This has been fascinating. Um, and I wanted to comment on what you just mentioned, Fouad, about the differences in incentives and salaries. And I, I guess this is something I remember from my childhood. I knew that the doctors, the Syrian doctors who used to go and work in Gulf countries and in Saudi Arabia used not to get the same salaries as people like as health workers coming from other countries, there were like obvious differences. And I think this is like still ongoing, unfortunately. So it's it, thanks for highlighting this. Um, so we're a little bit behind schedule. So I'm just gonna probably uh, open the Q&A and we'll start with, um, have a question for Ibadat. And uh, it's mainly about the uh, the WHO position in different countries and how they uh, basically represent the WHO representatives are kind of selected or approved by the different governments and if you think that um, how this relation or conflict of interest uh, might affect data collection and knowledge production or basically uh, the production the reports produced by WHO do you think this might um, affect that or how does WHO deal with these situations may I uh, give my own background so I am not a professional, I am a lawyer. So this is a, it seems, so I would suspect this is a leading question. So it is, a, you know, I, I cannot, and I mean, I don't know why WHO would not say that uh, uh, we are limiting any sort of uh, data gathering, data information. Uh, we would say quite the contrary, you know, so it's, uh, yeah. So that's, I mean, that's, uh, yeah. So I, I mean, a little more context on the question would help me. Yeah, I guess I guess what's mainly meant is uh, that maybe access, like WHO access to certain areas to, or to certain data might be restricted because in, in different conflicts or like specifically in Syria. And I don't know if you have anything to say on that. No, I don't know the specific context of Syria. And I think this is the, the, the issue, but uh, I think there's a lot, I can tell from my own area that even the data governments make available to us, uh, we work on bilateral agreements. Mm -hmm. Some of the data they're comfortable with us making public, other data they're not comfortable with us making public for their own reasons. So this is a line WHO has to balance all the time. So. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, I bet that. Um, and I think the second question is for Diana. Uh, so how uh, can we explain the lack of statistics on the number of healthcare workers impacted by COVID in Syria? Um, and is there, are there any actions taken to um, tackle this challenge? Do we have any information on this? I know that this has been extremely difficult and um, mm -hmm. very recent as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Rita. Um, and thank you to the, the person who asked the question. Um, I did want to touch on um, the question posed to Ibadat, uh, just to give like an overview of the resources that I shared. Um, I think uh, the issue with uh, WHO reporting sometimes is that it relies um, almost entirely in some contexts on Ministry of Health data. So that's how. That's why when I shared the HRAMS data, um, I included the caveat that you know this is Ministry of Health reported data, and I supplemented it with um, data reported by the health cluster um, in Turkey. 
which is able to uh, collect data from health implementing organizations on the ground. So that can often uh, supplement data provided by governments um, in particular contexts and can help fill some of those gaps. Um, so it's not necessarily WHO um, not having access to data, it's that the ministry, they rely wholly on Ministry of Health data. Yeah. Um, and then an answer, so COVID is very similar as well. Um, in Syria, we know that the number of COVID cases are, um, are underreported because you have uh, data being collected wholly by, whole, uh, wholly by the Ministry of Health. And um, unfortunately, the Ministry of Health um, hasn't been able to capture the entire situation across the country and particularly in areas where, you know, there's still um, ongoing hostilities or particularly in the south and, and Dara um, and other parts of, of southern Syria where access is, is much more difficult for patients to get tested. Um, so a lot of the, the reason why we don't see um, The, the large scale of COVID numbers uh, reported in Syria is because uh, of issues related to access um, uh, for patients getting testing and also the Ministry of Health um, covering data. Thank you areas. so much, Diana. Um, and the next question, I guess, is for Fuad. So what role do you think the health professional diaspora could play in the post-conflict Syrian health, health workforce recovery? Yeah, thank you for this question. Actually, that could be the last part of my speech that, you know, uh, my intervention that you didn't allow me to continue with. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I think still there is a role. I mean, given that we are not now good in technology, in communication, and I think, you know, uh, without having this need to have those people return one day to, to Syria, I think that could be something to link you know, to start building this network between those who are working inside the country, whether it's in, in you know, I mean, in, I mean, in different parts of the, the, the country, and those who are now settled in their new uh, career, new, uh, new countries. And by building this network, I mean, sort of tele-education, telemedicine, you know, sort of uh, uh, consulting centers, by building that, I think, there could be a sort of opportunity for improved training inside the country, you know, improve the uh, uh, treatment, management, you know, all, this, all these issues of to uh, sort of to support uh, and fill the gap uh, inside Syria, because we all know now there are uh, some specialties that almost disappeared in Syria. And there's sort of uh, uh, um, uh, towns and cities that are having few uh, even well-educated, doc well-trained doctors. So I think uh, the role of diaspora, if I can call them diaspora, I think those people can be, can be assets actually to help, but that couldn't be a sort of random, which is could be sometimes, that should be organized in a way or another. I mean, maybe building, I don't know, systems, you know, plans, projects, something about that, how to build this system to have a network that cross these sort of borders between inside and the, um, the uh, diaspora. Thank you so much, Fuad. And I, um, I think I, I want to highlight that it's very important to have some sort of political um, agreement and some sort of political stability for a lot of people who uh, are health workers or not who were uh, affected or who were involved in the political struggle in Syria for them to go back. So ultimately, yes, there will be factors needed for health workers to go back to Syria, but this, this, this also needs to be taken in the context of them being also sometimes involved in the political struggle. So um, uh, um, we can't really separate the two in uh, all cases. So. Thanks, Fouad. Uh, you actually just answered uh, another question just by that. So that's not, thank you. Um, so the next question is, uh, what are the possibilities, potential and strategies to coordinate the work as public health specialists and health workers to support the public health and medical system inside Syria? And <clears throat> I think that this question is uh, um, like, how could health workforce in, in, in other countries support health workforce inside Syria at the moment. And this is open to all panelists. I don't know who would like to answer this.
Oh, I'll jump in here really quickly. I think um, this is one of the main aims of the Syria Public Health Network is to be able to bring together um, uh, not only Syrian public health professionals, Syrian doctors, but also people interested and invested in supporting the Syrian healthcare workforce in Syria and abroad. Um, and so with the expansion of our website and our team here, as you can see, we have Hassam and, and um, Abdul Karim Iqzais from ARCH4HC who've joined us recently. Um, we're really hoping to um, create this network as a source for information, for evidence, especially numbers, and then um, to be able to um, create uh, opportunities for advocacy, like the video that was shared earlier by our colleagues um, on, on this issue. So you can rely on us on a, as a resource um, to, to support the Syrian healthcare workforce. And I'm not sure if any of my colleagues have anything to add. Yeah, I would like, I, I think that this is really an important issue. And just to add to what Diana mentioned, uh, I think there's a need now from us people, work, people working in public health and you know being exposed to all these challenges. I think there's a need now to build a different paradigm about the issue of you know uh, health education, especially inside. So we know that's a, a huge lack of you know different uh, different specialties and different uh, different aspects of of health inside Syria, and it's not just the clinical side, but also to all, to all other issues. You know, epidemiology, you know, health management, all these issues, a huge lack. And I think there's a need now to start building this new paradigm. We all know when we were in Syria that those who are working in 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 public health should come from this sort of um, I think we lost Fuad for, okay, so I think we will move to the next question and hopefully Fuad will be able to rejoin us, um, but thanks Diana and thanks Fuad uh, for your answers. Um, Rita, I'm but... sorry, uh, Ibadat is willing to speak. Yes. Hi, uh, sorry uh, Rita, um, I just wanted to build on what uh, Diana and Fuad were saying. I think there's another issue that, I, that is linked to the, what we are discussing here, is that when we see from our data on the work that migrant health workers are doing, uh, for, ex for example, we looked at data in Ireland, that most of the health workers, around 80% of the positions in the non-consultant hospital doctors who are not in training or ability to move on to a specialist post are the foreign health workers. Right, so, so we are talking about this diaspora providing skills around specialties and missing specialties. But I think that we can also see the places where they end up going to work, they're not, being, they're not working at the level that they probably would have liked to work. So again, in Ireland, it's a non-consultant hospital doctors, not in training position. Uh, similarly, we see this elsewhere. In Filipino nurses, in, in, in the US, it was a big story that Filipino nurses make up 4% of the uh, uh, U.S. Uh, nursing workforce, but they accounted for one third of the nursing death, right? So they're unable to say no to some of the jobs that others are able to say no to. So it is a tricky issue. And um, um, in Sudan, where we also work closely, we can see Sudan is next to Saudi Arabia, that they were able to make an agreement where they send their people to do specialties in the, uh, so this is Sudan Medical Specialization Board, working actively with Saudi Arabia, knowing that Saudi Arabia needs them, but that they're getting specialized in things that they want specialties in. And they have the same agreement with Ireland. So they're able to send uh, Sudanese uh, people to Ireland to provide service, but at the same time get the specialties in anesthesia, OBGYN, things that they know they need back in uh, Sudan. So I think this is one, this is area that perhaps you could, uh, the, the group could work to try to support uh, and then, or at least bring advocacy forward for to show that the people who are there maybe are not working to the level that they should be working. Um, the other thing that in terms of data that was useful, uh, it was unusual for WHO, uh, we did on migration is that we did used, uh, we tried to get data on uh, migrant, Indian migrant doctors. Uh, and there's, you know, these cohort studies take a long time. And these young researchers were able to do use WhatsApp team leads from uh, six medical schools, and they were able to track 97% of them within a three-week period. 
So I know Syria is a totally different context, but when you start trying to collect data using a different type of tools, like WhatsApp groups and things like this, perhaps you can get a different type of uh, information than than when we try to do it very formally through WHO yeah. and in peer review publications. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very interesting. I mean, uh, I'm 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 sure um, I'm, data might could be collected in like different data and. What I notice is that different data is available in different uh, databases, but not always shared or not always compiled. And that's a very interesting point about sharing them in using different tools. So I really hope that this is one of the takes that we will have from this um, from this um, panel discussion. I'm conscious of time. We have two minutes left. So I guess my open question to all the panelists, and I think as a start, we the question is, um, what do you think that donor agencies should do and where do you think they should invite displaced health workers? And um, this question is open to all of you. And I guess this will be our last question. So please, if you can be brief. Yeah, I can start quickly and build, you know, and also building on the, the last note I mentioned before being cut off uh, is about this building this uh, network uh, uh, to connect, you know, Syrian doctors and health workers inside Syria with those who are in 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 Europe and and uh, in the US. So I think by by doing this, that could be some sort of investment for uh, improving education, training, and also maybe help in to have this sort of attention. Thanks, Fouad. Uh, so I guess the question is um, now, what do you think that like the audience is um, health workers, public health workers, pub, um, uh, people from uh, international and national uh, organizations and researchers and academic and probably policymakers as well. Um, I think it will be really good to basically just if we can go through go um each and just maybe one um like one point that you should you think that we should all remember um uh from this webinar i don't know diana would you like to start sure it's a tough task but um i think um given that i've had the opportunity to speak to a lot of healthcare workers both inside syria and who those who are displaced i think um attention to this issue is critical and making sure that um, advocacy like the one that was done through the video, which really humanizes the experience of uh, Syrian healthcare workers is uh, really important. Um, I want to emphasize data, but also, you know, these people, they're not just numbers, like they have, um, you know, lives and families. And I think um, doing uh, advocacy is one of the most important things um, regarding this issue. So, thank you so much. Hussam, do you want to add? Yeah, I think my main message is that, as we noticed that, all healthcare providers are in assets in, in the countries where they are working and providing healthcare to uh, hosting communities. And I think recognizing their rights of being treated equally within the countries where they are working in and being protected against discrimination and racism is, is a key point for their integ integration with their, unfortunately, uh, unfortunate to say, their new homes and new places to live. Thanks, Hossam. Um, uh, Vince, I see that you raised your hand. Yes, it's just just to the appeal, really. Um, for the Syrian Public Health Network, we're always wanting to recruit existing mentors uh, for our doctors. So whether um, because of the current COVID situation and the things like Zoom, they don't have to be based in the UK. So if any doctors are a part of the network who would like to mentor some of our doctors, we'd be delighted to take you on board. Thank you so much. Ibada, do you want anything? Do you want to add anything? No, I think uh, uh, for me, I think I think the rights of the uh, refugee, migrant, displaced health workers is fundamental. But at the same time, people are resilient. You know, they find solutions. Uh, I think the big challenge is then how do you ensure that the diaspora is able to support uh, the Syrian health system back, back home? Because in COVID, we saw in the rich countries, people went back home to support their countries. Uh, from a feeling of uh, wanting to support their country. So how can this be supported? You know, in, uh, yeah. in a Thank country. you very I much. I think Fawad brought this up. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks, Ibadat. 
Fuad, um, do you have anything to add before we close? Uh, nothing, just to say that, you know, the, the health worker, the health worker is not a career issue. It's a sort of a human rights issue. I think that this is important to think about it from this perspective. And so people are not just seeking for, for, for you know, their career, but also for a lifestyle. So thank you. Thank you so much, Fuad. And speakers today, and I would like uh, this uh, panel discussion and to bring all of us together today. Thanks for all of you who attended today. Uh, we will be providing a summary of the key discussion points from today and we will share on the websites of the organizing group all these uh, discussion points and you can subscribe to the Syria Public Health Network website for updates and stay tuned for upcoming events um, uh, and you can find them on Twitter and on their website. So, Thanks everyone.